So hello everybody. Um, this is your host Nagu. Um, welcome to another uh, enlightening session at Z Block Two Y Academy. So our speaker today is Naliti, uh, a Y Academy core member and resident. Uh, Naliti will be discussing the Halo Two framework and. Delving deep into intricacies of creating chips, circuits, and gadgets in Rust for zero knowledge groups. Um, but before we start, uh, some basic checklist. Uh, first, uh, post your queries in the chat room, and Nality will answer at the end of the lecture. And please note that the deadline for our our uh, threat analysis, uh, the the broken uh, MSD for summer has passed. However, if you didn't submit your report yet, we encourage you to do so. We will review and provide feedback, uh, although it might not qualify for any reward. Uh, on Friday, Sama will continue with the code base review. Uh, please make sure you check the calendar periodically for any changes, updates. Uh, we had some major uh, updates uh, last weekend. Uh, so let's get started. Uh, let's start the recording. It's already uh, done. Good. Without further ado, let's welcome Nality. Awesome. Um, hey everyone, let me share my screen. All right, this is Nalti from Y Academy. And as you might know, um, we are here to dig deep into Halo 2. And before we do that, Let's go back to the basics. Uh, let's do a quick recap of what we know so far. So if you're into the ZK world, you might have uh, uh, seen this pipeline very many times um, across Twitter, on blogs. And if you just look at the pipeline, it starts by converting a circuit uh, into an R1CS, rank one constraint system, and ends with a ZK proof, uh, ZK snark. So this can be generalized into this. So you can, uh, rather than specifically mentioning R1CS, you can extend it to any constraint system. So a circuit can be converted into a constraint system and then fed into the proof system of your choice, uh, not your choice, um, and then you get the proof. So a very familiar constraint system for all the fellows here would be r and I guess. Um, so in rank one constraint system, we specify the inputs, outputs, and the auxiliary variables or the signals um, as uh, in a rank one matrix where there's just one row and uh, the R1CS constraints satisfy this one equation of A uh, dot product with B equals C. Um, so in layman's terms, it would be like left-hand side multiplied by right-hand side has to be equal to the output. Now, this is a very simple constraint system. Uh, there's not too many jargons. And uh, it has been standardized since 2016. So uh, this is great for smaller uh, projects, which have like um, very less lines of codes. Uh, so this is great, but when we go beyond this, like when you start building a ZK AVM, um, it has its own shortcomings. So starting from there's no support for custom gates. So everything uh, which exists in R1CS either has to be uh, specified as multiplication or addition. Um, and that's not too good for when we're doing complex math and elliptical operations. 
Um, the next one is lookups aren't supported. So uh, we are in the age of lookups. Lookups are extremely useful, but um, with R1 CS, it's not uh, really possible. And uh, one very familiar proof system which uses R1 CS is Grot16. We've been using it since like 2016, and it requires circuit specific process setup. And this might be an issue for um, projects which have like huge circuits or very many circuits. And with Circom as a DSL and Bellman as a library, um, there's not too many tools or you don't have a great developer experience as well. So R1CS tools have their own shortcomings. So this was noted by the Zcash team who used Bellman and Grot16 for their projects, um, Sapling and Sprout in 2016. And they wanted a much more customizable uh, library and a proof system. So they created Halo 2 um, to support uh, the shielded transactions in Zcash and they did it in 2020. So, yeah, modern snacks, as you might know, uh, are made of like a polynomial commitment scheme and an IOP. So uh, just like that, the Halo 2 library, which uses the Plonk proving system, uh, uses um, IPA, which is in inner product argument as their pre-CS, and uh, Plonk as their IOP. So proof systems are named after IOPs. So uh, this was Zcash's version. Uh, they created Halo 2 with IPA and Plunk. And then uh, the PSE guys forked it. And instead of IPA, um, they put up KZG, uh, which is a commitment scheme, um, very friendly with the Ethereum ecosystem. So it, uh, because it's user sparing friendly because on. So yeah, uh, we know how the RNCS equation looks like. It's just a dot b equals c and you specify everything in form of multiplication um, in form of dot product. Uh, but that's not the same case with Planck. The standard Planck equation looks something like this, but it, uh, although it looks confusing in the beginning, um, it's extremely customizable. So starting from QL um, into XA, so if you go like this, this is the left selector polynomial. QR is the right selector polynomial and QO is the output selector polynomial uh, and so on. So you can sort of specify anything with this equation uh, just by giving suitable values to the selector polynomials. Uh, it could be addition, it could be multiplication, or even Boolean. Uh, yeah, so you just saw a Planckish arithmetization where you use the Planck equation to express the constraints. Now, uh, if you just go back to the R1CS thing, we had a very small matrix which had just one row and a lot of columns. And if you draw parallels to this, uh, the Halo 2 matrix, or it so looks like a table, uh, this has a lot of columns in a rows. So uh, generally, it's um, 2 to the power k rows, and k uh, fluctuates somewhere. You can use something like k equals 11 or 12. And there's support for more as well. So it has like huge rows and columns. And we, we conceptualize this circuits in a huge matrix. So uh, the table or the matrix is in, the, uh, in turn divided into multiple columns and they are named and colored as well. So let's start with the first one, which is the instance column. The instance column contains inputs uh, shared between the prover and the verifier. In short, it's public inputs. You give it in at the beginning 
um, we need to supply all the inputs, all the private witnesses and public inputs. And then we have our advice columns. It's usually red or pink in color. And um, these are only, um, these contain only private values. And also they contain um, auxiliary values, which are like um, given by the prover after some computation, which are supposed to remain private. And then we have the fixed columns. Now in the fixed columns, uh, you also have something called as the selector column, uh, which I have specified here. So the fixed columns can be used for um, lookup tables and selector columns and anything uh, uh, which contains pre-processed values. Um, so that is lookup. And in terms of rows, as I said, there are like two part K rows of which uh, we have two part K minus T minus one usable rows, which means uh, we can assign values to the cells in these rows. And then we have the last T rows, which are called blinding rows uh, because they contain blinding factors. Now, what are these blinding factors? Uh, yeah, let's shift to IP. This is where uh, we would come to know where these blinding factors come from. So in an ideal world where we have an interactive protocol, uh, the prover sends the verifier the commitment of a polynomial and the verifier in turn sends a random value, a random challenge. The prover has to calculate the commitment at a random challenge and return it to the verifier. And the verifier would check if this is fine and uh, yeah, accept the proof if this is okay. But we don't live in an ideal world and this is not possible, especially in terms of uh, computer programs. So we replace it with something called Fiat Shamir. So we just remove the role, we just reduce the role of the verifier and replace it with a random oracle. And in a real world situation, the random oracle is often a hash function. So the pro would send the commitment to the polynomial and a few other details. And the random oracle would then hash all these um, and send it back to the prover. Now, this is completely unpredictable, uh, means completely random. And then the prover calculates uh, the commitment at a random value and sends it back to the verifier. Now, these random uh, values are called bl b blinding factors, which are here in the last T rows. So that is um, Halo 2 table for you. And yeah, now that we have covered rows and columns, let's come back to cells. Um, so cell value uh, has obviously three um, options. So initially, uh, uh, by default, the cells are unassigned and instantiated to zero. Uh, and we can assign it to a specific value, which has to be inside the field. Or it could be a poison cell. Now, what does poison cell mean? Again, let's go back to the blinding rows. So the cells in these um, T blinding rows are called poison cells. Uh, which means that um, if you're done uh, assigning all these all the cells in these rows, you cannot use up these. Um, so it's exclusively for the blinding factors. So, and if you do try to use these, you would get a constrained poisoned error or something. So yeah, that's poison cell for you. And yeah, if you assign a cell more than once, you can do that, um, which people usually do by mistake, uh, then the shade would be darker than its surrounding cells. So yeah, 
it, the shade usually depends on how many times you assign it. So that is um, rows, columns, and cells of a Halo 2 table or a matrix. Um, other than that, uh, every column is a polynomial in a Lagrange form. And yeah, this is not usually used while circuit building, but it's really good to know. Right. So we just covered the basic structure of the Halo 2 matrix or a table. Now, if we want to use the table and assign values and constraint circuits, and then um, obviously generate proofs, we would have to use the Halo 2 API, which is in Rust. And uh, there are like four interfaces, which are really important to know, starting from chips, um, layouter, floor planner, and circuits. So uh, layouter and floor planner would be like the same thing somehow. And you would have chips, circuits, and gadgets. Let's start with chips. Um, so chips are like the basic building block of a Halo 2 circuit. And every chip starts with a config. So you see the one on right. Um, I have a struct called add config. And it has um, column A, column B, column C, which are <clears throat> advice columns. And then I've introduced a selector, um, which would create a selector column for this chip. So this is what a config looks like. And you can add anything. You can add uh, fixed columns. Um, you can add instance columns. So it's up to the user and the requirements. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it looks something like this. So we have a struct, um, which is add config, and we would obviously create uh, an add chip struct, and this is the implementation. So it would start by, uh, this is just a function which returns the struct itself. And then we would have the configure function. So all our gates and lookups are created here in this function. So um, we can create a gate by just doing meta.createGate. And we can also create lookups and tables. So that is done here in the configure function. And then you have assigning rows and columns and cells. Uh, so you can create any number of functions here to assign rows, and you can create your custom functions. It could be assigned columns, regions, or anything. But and inside these functions, you would use the you would something you would use something called as a layouter, um, which we just saw here to assign regions and rows and cells and columns. And finally, we have expose public, which is uh, which exposes like a public value, uh, which exposes the result as a public value. So yeah, these are like the four main functions inside the chip. And you can sort of, uh, this is like the bare bones of it. And you can use multiple or single chips to create a circuit. And this is how chips look like. The next one would be layouter, as we just discussed, that um, when you're assigning cells and values and stuff, uh, we would be using layouter. So what a layouter does it is it allows you to add uh, regions, and it allows you to name these regions. So you could actually name these regions anything. You could name it uh, row one, or row three, or you know, four blocks or something. And uh, yeah, it has its own functions like assigned regions, assigned cell, assigned advice columns, and such. And we would be using layouter to implement a layout. 
And you could do the same for table as well. The next thing and the final one um, is our circuit. But we see a jargon over here, a floor planner. Now, what's a floor planner? So um, as we saw, a layout allows us to assign regions on the Halo 2 table. But a floor planner arranges it um, using some sort of a first bit strategy or maybe a last bit strategy um, to uh, save up area, so to save up rows and columns. So we have an optimized circuit. Now, why do we need to optimize? Um, uh, the reason is pretty simple. Uh, the rows and columns obviously affect the prover and the verifier costs. So um, the fewer columns, we would have low verification costs. And the fewer rows, we would have um, fast provers. So which is why uh, we just add this line, uh, simple flow planner. And this is what it does. And the final thing is obviously the circuit. So um, in the circuit, uh, we have the we have two parts. It's configure and synthesize. And configure, we use. Um, uh, so we basically put everything together. We do the exact gate arrangement or the column arrangement and make multiple chips come together, and we arrange it in such a way and synthesize. Um, this is like the final step where you sort of arrange everything properly. So to just recap, uh, we have chips, we have floor planner, we have layouter, and we have circuits. So uh, we've just had a look at chips. It's uh, the basic building block. And then we had a look at the flow planner and the layouter. Layouter helps you assign regions, cells and columns to the table. And the flow planner sort of arranges it. Um, and then we have circuits, uh, which brings all the chips and stuff together. And this is how you write a basic Halo 2 circuit. Yeah, let's zoom out a bit and see where Halo 2 fits in. So Halo 2 is sort of um, a library which provides a front end for us to write circuits. And um, using its table-like structure, it does the arithmetization so well, creates constraints, and produces uh, proofs using Planck. So this is sort of a basic idea of Halo 2. Now, if you have any questions, this is like the first part of the presentation. So I'll, I'll take a few questions, and then we'll go into a live example. All right, great. Uh, I think we do have some some questions in the in the chat. Mm -hmm. But uh, before I go to there, maybe uh, you could uh, briefly explain um, uh, the difference between Real the columns. columns. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it's just a way of presenting um, the values. Uh, so if you, if you just go back. If we had a look at matrices, uh, this is like an R1CS system. So this itself is a matrix with just one row and like one, two, three, four, five, six columns. And uh, this is a very simple representation. Uh, this expanded uh, is the Halo 2 table. It's like a huge table with um, multiple rows. And then you have these columns, which are in, uh, which are uh, in multiple colors, as you see. It's um, gray, pink, and purple. So uh, it's just a way of representation. We use these rows and columns.
if anybody else has question they could ask what is k here oh is he referring to this k k is uh, you actually provide k uh, i think it's customizable so you basically specify the number of rows and columns you want in in halo 2 so you don't take up a lot um, so something like a k equals 11 would be 2 power 11 that's like around 2048 rows and if you don't need those many uh, then you can sort of settle for less and um, the number of rows also decides um, the trusted uh, the trusted setup the SRS so yeah it's a number you give to customize your halo to table yeah k can also be the number of gates Uh, so now the uh, else? Mm -hmm. yeah hi nago i uh, just a quick maybe comments or uh, a way to uh, maybe relate to what chips are do you mm -hmm. think there is an analogy between chips uh, and the, the notion of a function so you would take something and encapsulate it into a, a chip and it could be uh, used by different uh, uh, different circuits you could just plug it and uh, plug yeah. it into, into something so it, it's similar to the uh familiar notion of a function in software but here, yeah, yeah because we're fiddling with like tables and it, it looks like a hardware circuit more or more like it mm -hmm. so yeah this is uh, just wanted to say this is one way of thinking about these uh these chips yeah that's right uh you can have like a library of chips and reuse it as you want um but there is obviously uh, security issues there because uh, you would have to see if uh, if there's any column collision or cell collision between chips. Uh, but yeah, that's for another day. But you can think of chips as templates in Circom. Um, uh, like you have library of uh, templates in Circom lib and you can think of chips that way. Yeah. And does anyone have any questions? All right, let's continue. Yep. So let me share the GitHub. Uh, if you've been through Xerox Park's uh, learning course, you would find a lot of Halo 2 examples um, and also live coding. So, yeah, they built a Fibonacci circuit in multiple ways. There are like four examples, and you can go through them all. And, yeah, I think this would be good. So let's start with, uh, as we said, a chip starts with a config. And here our chip is a Fibonacci chip. So it starts with Fibonacci config, where we take in um, three advice columns, a selector and an instance column. Now the instance column is here for the public input. And the selector uh, determines whether the gate has to be on or off. And the advice columns are obviously for the witnesses and the private inputs. If you just move down, we define the chip, the Fibonacci chip, and we take in the Fibonacci config. And in our implementation, here we go, we have our configure function where we take a fresh column, an advice column, and assign it to um, the three columns we just mentioned in our config. 
So it's three fresh advice columns uh, assigned to column A, column B, and column C. And then we have a selector column assigned to selector. N now, uh, when you sort of plot the columns, uh, you wouldn't see a separate selector column. It's inside the fixed um, columns. So, and next we have the instance column, which is on the left, um, which is of white color, yeah. So we sort of um, take all these fresh columns, we assign it, and we enable equality, and then we create a gate. Uh, you can sort of um, create any gate you want. They have a very simple one which is add. So here they have sort of visualized it. And what this does is it queries the advice columns and it queries the selector. And if the selector is one, then this constraint has to pass. And if the selector is zero, uh, we don't sort of care. And the advice columns, uh, how we refer to the cells, are via relative offsets. So if you want to query this cell, uh, which is sort of the first cell, we would say rotation.current. And if you want to query the next cell, we would say rotation um, colon colon next. Or maybe the third one, then we would say uh, rotation. I mean, we would do a bracket in with two. So this is how you query advice call you query cells in the advice columns, and you create a constraint. So uh, s multiplied by a plus b minus c. Uh, it basically says that um, if s is one, the constraint has to hold, and otherwise uh, we don't care. And we return the config. This is uh, pretty simple. And this is what our configure function does. Uh, next, we have two public functions. I think it's two, yeah. Um, since it's a Fibonacci circuit, um, the first row would be one and one. And we would add it, and it would be two. I think we do that first. And the rest of it is just, um, we just loop through it. So the first one, which is assigning the first row, we use our layouter. As I said, we would use layouter to assign regions. Um, there, are, there is no assign columns or assign rows function. There is just regions, and you can model it that way. We give it a name. We give it first row. And we sort of take every cell, like this is the A cell, column A, this B, this one's C. And what we do here is we take the inputs from the instance columns. So the first inputs, which is one and one, are public and are given in the instant columns. So we take that and assign it to the uh, to the column A um, in the first row, which is indexed, um, so it's zero. And so is this one. So it's the second column and the first row. And the cell C is where we compute the sum of it. So this would be one, this would be one. We compute the sum of it and assign it in cell C. So we also name it. So it's A plus B, and we assign the value. So this is what we do for the first row. And for the next rows, um, let's see what we do. It's the same thing, uh, layouter.assign region. We give it a name, next row. and if you just see here, I think I missed it. On the first line, you have uh, an option. So you write whether you want to enable a selector or not. And if you miss this, um, the default value of your selector would be 0, and uh, your constraint won't be evaluated. 
So we enable the selector and we copy the value. So it would be one, one, and one plus one is two in the first row. So we copy one and two. So we copy the values <clears throat> to the column A and column B. And again, we sum it and assign it to C. Uh, yep. And this has to be done. Uh, um, this has to be done till the number we want the Fibonacci circuit for. So this function will be called like multiple times. So this is assign first row. And this one is assign rows gender function. And the next one is expose public. Uh, so it sort of um, gets the result and uh, constrain it, constrains it and uh, populates it in the instance columns, which is like public. So it's exposed public. And this is our chip. That's how you design a chip. And then we have our circuit. So um, we specify the type of flow planner. For now, there's just one, which is simple flow planner. And then we have our configure and synthesize functions. So in our configure function, um, uh, we just given our constraint system. Since there's only one chip, there's not, there's not much to do. And then in the synthesize function, we specify a few details. So let's see what we do. So we get the chip and then we assign the first row and we get the values of B and C, which B1 and 2. And starting from 3 until 10, um, we use the assign row function to do the Fibonacci circuits for the rest of the numbers. I think this is like a very easy logic, so you would get. And then in the end, um, you would have your output in the C column, in the column C. Uh, we sort of, we use this expose public function to push it to the instance column. So this is what our circuit does. And that is it. The rest, uh, the rest is tests. And then we have like the dev graph where we plot the table, which you just saw. And that is how we get to know what's what and what's been plotted. So this is like one example. You can go through the rest of the examples to get a clear idea. I don't know if you have any questions. Yep. Yeah, we have a question. Um, why is the, the enable equality is necessary here? Uh, I think Y Academy just answered it. So, oh. Oh. yeah. Surprised. Yeah. Um, no more questions. So just a quick comment, maybe it's not a question, but mm -hmm. uh, we think about the selector and the advice columns. Mm -hmm. um, this is sort of uh, where the, uh, let's say, the elegance or customizability of uh, Halo 2 proving system is, is better than the R1CS uh, right. mm -hmm. thing, because you could, um, the, the selector is an on and off uh, switch. And the advice is sort of um, you can have public inputs uh, per row, while in in R one CS you have to um, you have to have the whole witness for the entire thing, 
uh, um, uh, being involved in basically every gate, being involved in the when you multiply through the whole equation, the whole thing has right. to while mm -hmm. here you we are kind of like custom uh, inserting these public inputs and turning on and off things uh, very um, uh, in a very customizable way on a gate by gate basis basically. So I, th I think, if I'm not mistaken, this is where the source of flexibility in in Plunkish arithmetization, this is where the flexibility comes from and what allows the, finally, what allows the number of, the total number of constraints to be way less than an equivalent implementation in R1CS. That's um, right, yeah. Yeah, it gives you flexibility uh, and you can zoom in Okay, at this specific gate, I'm gonna turn on and off these things. I'm gonna uh, the, the 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 public input are going to be injected at this specific steps, but not not anywhere else. While in R1CS, you have to have the entire witness column at the very beginning, and you there is a cost to it at every step, even when you don't need them. Um, so yeah, this is uh, we can we can confirm the Enrico later on, but I think this is the the source of uh, flexibility in in Plunkish arithmetization that makes eventually at the end of of the computation that makes the number of constraints uh, way less than uh, what would have been if we uh, we were using R one CS. That's right. Yeah, it gives you like granular controls, so yes. you can do complex tasks. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. If I may add, uh, mm -hmm. this is Niku, uh, the other major difference between selector columns, advice columns is, uh, first of all, the both are fixed columns. And the advice columns uh, you can use to save the, uh, the private witness, so private input variables and any kind of intermediate variables that the prover has to use. Uh, the selector columns, you like uh, uh, Ali explained, you use them to selectively enable certain kind of constraints in new constraint system. So you can think like selector is a very special case of this uh, fist column that can enable only certain kind of uh, constraints. And that's where the... the, the, the concept of custom gates uh, come from, I think. It's because of this uh, flexibility, granularity of control. Yep. All right, I think we can continue. Yep, so uh, I, I think the comments were really enlightening and would have cleared a lot of doubts. And uh, yep. Uh, so I would obviously ask the fellows to go through the rest of the examples. And um, if the fellows are ready for a question, um, I think I can do that. Let me share my screen again. Right, so zooming out, you get a high idea of what Halo 2 does and what it manages. Um, coming back to the tools, I think there was a question asked in the first session about the tools we're going to use. But before that, um, let's imagine a scenario where you assign a lot of values to the Halo 2 table. And one of the values does not make it to the polynomials and the equations, uh, which are done by Planck. Um, how would you find it? I think that would be a good uh, problem to think of. So maybe I can write it somewhere. Uh, but the problem statement is you are a developer and you assign an you write a circuit where you assign and constrain multiple values. And you just see that one of the values hasn't made it um, to the polynomials and the equations and the constraint systems. Um, in terms of Halo 2 table, how would, how would you build a tool to find it? Or what would you do to find it? 
I think that's like an important question to think of before you dive into the tools. Um, we have like very limited tools. The first one being Halo 2 Analyzer. So it does um, find um, three uh, pitfalls, I would say. So the first one is it, um, it's sort of a limping tool. So it finds unused columns. Unused columns and rows can be optimized by a malicious prover. Um, and Halo 2 Analyzer does that for us and finds it, but there's a lot of false positives. And the next thing it does is finds um, values that have been assigned, but not constrained and which did not make it to uh, the equations, but are still in the region. So uh, these are like baby steps towards Halo 2 tooling. And this is what's done by Halo 2 Analyzer. And the second one is PolyXN. Um, it's it's very raw. It's not usable, but I, I think you guys should give it a try. There's this Discord message, a, a full length explanation by Edward. Um, uh, where he explains how he calculates the values using PolyXN. And it's in Halo 2 ecosystem Discord, so be sure to join it. And the next thing is, um, I've missed a lot of topics when it comes to Halo 2. Uh, it's cycles of curves, um, I, I don't know, permutation check, equality constraints. Uh, lookups, Sinsamia, and how to generate verifier contracts, how to do trusted setups. Um, because I just wanted to focus on the Halo 2 circuit structure and the API. So I've sort of um, curated all these resources and the bugs uh, which come in with Halo 2 um, in this Notion site. So uh, be sure to start um, going through the site and we would have a small quiz today, um, right after the session maybe. And the deadline's tomorrow at 9 a.m. UTC. So you would just have five questions um, which you would have to answer. So yeah, that is it. And I think I made it early, yeah. Right. Uh, we have a few more minutes. If anybody has any questions, it doesn't have to be based on this session, but in general, since we have some time, we could, we could, we could take those things and try to help you out. Yeah, uh, this was great. No, okay, thank you. Uh, just going back to the big picture. So in this specific Plonk instantiation that Suma is built on top, it's built on the PSE instantiation. Mm -hmm. So yep. um, what you talked about today is basically on what uh, I usually call the reduction phase. So we take a computation and reduce it to um, um, uh, a representation that is the, 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 the columns basically. And then from the, then on, like the polynomials are woven out and then we get a series of cryptographic stuff that is applied to them. So in this specific uh, instantiation, what we have in the back end, basically we have KZG as the commitment scheme. Mm -hmm. and we have, uh, what else do we have in the, in the back end there in terms of uh, self-contained concepts that probably the fellows should be aware of and have a general understanding, but may not, we may not get to audit KZG itself, for example, but it's good to know what happens to, um, what, what is up, being applied on these polynomials, uh, in the back end. So we have KZG, what else is in there? Hmm, um, I think common errors, this, um, there are a lot of errors when you run mock prover in Halo 2. So I guess he, um, fellows could get familiar with that. In terms of concepts, um, I don't know.
we all obviously have the Fiat Shamir as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. of interactivity. Um, I think more of how how the layout there works. Um, people make a lot of mistakes while assigning the regions. Um, usually because the circuit building is too uh, it's too tiresome, so people just copy paste and override the cells. So a very good understanding of how the layout works and the differences between PSC and Zcash forks. There are a lot of differences. So um, yeah, I, I think the fellows could have a solid understanding of that. Remember right, one major difference between the Zcash Hello2 and PSC Hello2 besides the, the commitment scheme. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Hello2 only supports fixed tables, but PSC Hello2 also supports dynamic tables, if I'm correct. They're on it, but I, I don't think it's in practice right now. They have a lot of differences. Yeah, there's like Zcash uses FASTA curves, uh, which again is topic for cycles of curves. And yeah. PSE uses BN254 with Grumkin. Right, so yeah. we use a different cycle. Yeah, so our prime field would change. So we would have to be very careful about the numbers we use it, as it has to be less than the prime field of the BN256 curve. Um, another major change would be trusted setup. In mm -hmm. Zcash, there there was no trusted setup, and now we do. It's a universal trusted setup. Um, another change would be, yeah, the ability to verify your proofs on change. I think that is brought by KZG. So... Yeah, KZG is like a major part of it. So, any other questions? Maybe I will ask one more question uh, so that uh, it will probably help the fellows who have never. Um, looked into any kind of halo to circuit development uh, maybe nullity you could explain like what is the typical flow or process of creating um, a circuit development in halo to so that uh, fellows at least have some kind of idea and then when they are looking at some code they would see okay now this is the actual flow that goes through that's a nice question um you would first create um, you would first architect the map of what you want to do and then create the chips first. So like the chips are like the basic building blocks. They are like the functions and templates. You would create multiple chips um, and then you would assign the regions and then you would put it all together in a circuit. So this is how it goes. It's from chips to all the way to the circuits. Um, I think it should be the same process when we are debugging these circuits and auditing them. Yeah. That's great. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Are there any simple projects built on Halo 2? You would find a lot of examples on Halo 2, like tutorials. And I think Suma itself is a very simple project built on Halo 2. The other ones are like ZK VMs. So yeah, you would definitely find a lot of projects. 
can the proofs generated by Zcash Halo 2 verified on chain? No. How does KVG enable on chain proving? So, uh, Zcash uses this curves called pasta curves, and they are neither pairing friendly nor they are EVM friendly. And um, if you know that EVM uses this pairing friendly curves, so when you use KZG, uh, you can sort of compute the commitment off chain and check if the proof is right on chain using pairings. And EVM has support for pairings. It has like pre compiles for pairings. So it's a KZG EVM pre compiles thing. Yeah. I found a similar code in Suma and the example code you shared today. Uh -huh. I think Is you it... have some more statement than a question looks like. It's probably oh, following. Yeah. Right. All right. One last chance. Any questions? If not, we could... Uh, wrap it up today and thank you Naliti that's a very great session and uh, as always if you have any questions post them in the uh, oh, look. sorry maybe I'll stop it I'll take this question last one um, Warren says why can we not verify the cache hello to proofs on chain is it something to do with IPA Yes. So, uh, as I said, Zcash uses pasta curves. The curves used by Zcash are different from the from the curves used in EVM. So, EVM has precompiled support only for BN two fifty six, and not for pasta curves. And if it did, then we might be able to verify these Zcash Halo two proofs on chain. So, yeah. Yeah, so verification typically involves uh, arithmetic on values of a certain curve. And mm -hmm. then that curve needs to be supported on uh, the EVM. So yeah, as Nolati says, the curve used by Zcash is not recognizable by the EVM. So you can do verification there. But you can with the curves used in uh, KZG. Um, so that's why that's why it works. All right. Thank you, Naliti. So uh, we can stop the recording. Mm -hmm.